classical plate theory is a study of thin, flat sheet material. We know that many structures in the world, such as in vehicles and appliances, structure. There also are plastic laminates and other applications such as window material made of glass. So we're surrounded by plates. If the material is curved, and if that's uh, taken into account, then you could call it a shell. But we're going to concentrate on the classical theory of plates in this lecture, and this is in contrast to another approach, which are the Minlin theories. Now, the classical theory assumes plane sections remain plane and perpendicular to a neutral surface, whereas the Minlin theories would allow the plate to have shearing deformation. In our theory, we will study flexure and stretching, but we're going to study infinitesimal deformations, so we don't get interested in the interaction between those two. So it would be called a linear theory, a linear infinitesimal theory. I'll only briefly introduce the Dirac delta function so that we can use it in solving a problem. Our problem session will use both potential energy formulations and Glurkin's method. Flexure and stretching are the two dominant behavioral characteristics of plates. We're going to study flexure much more intensively because the stretching problem is actually a plane stress problem, which we've seen before. Now, the major assumptions in the Kirchhoff Love plate theory are as follows. That you have here a flat plate of uniform thickness. It's thin such that the height of the material, H, or the thickness, is much less than either plan dimension by a factor of 10 or more. We'll use linear elastic materials, infinitesimal deflections, and then call on the plane sections remaining plane and perpendicular to the neutral surface. I show that here as a possible form of deformation. But what we rule out is this kind of shearing deformation shown here, where now the there are plane sections in the cross section that have remained plane, but they're no longer perpendicular to the middle surface of the plate. One of the things you should uh, make sure you understand is a spelling of Kirchhoff's name. This is Mr. Churchyard in German, and it has two H's. So I will expect everyone who's viewed this course to spell Kirchhoff's name correctly. Let's set up a sign convention that is a unifying convention for both beams and plates. I'll show a number of figures following this one that will illustrate the sense of the various forces and moments and twists. Typically what we ask is that the viewer be in the first octant and looking toward the origin. Then, whether you're speaking of plates or beams, you take a rectangular prism and consider that there are positive surfaces that are seen from your viewpoint. Now, we're going to define positive force resultants as well, including both forces and moments and twists, as being defined on the, those positive surfaces, and they have a certain effect on the structure. They cause compression in the top fiber of both beams and plates, as well as causing positive displacements, slopes, and curvatures on those um, positive surfaces. Now, this turns out to be the Timoshenko sign convention for beams and the convention that's used in the Nastran series of programs for plates, as well as in uh, many other finite element programs. There's a difference in plates because that's not the standard classical elasticity sign convention, sometimes called the Timoshenko convention for plates, where you have positive components pointing in the positive axis direction. So we're going to violate that in terms of moments. Our moments do not necessarily point in the positive axis direction. You've already seen the sign convention for beams, so now let's look at a figure for plates. These are indeed all positive quantities. 
they have been defined on what I've called the positive faces of the plate. Notice that this twist is not along the positive y-axis, uh, nor is this moment here in the direction of the positive y-axis. And so there are at least two components that don't follow what would have been uh, something like a Timoshenko convention. But you'll get used to this, and it's a really powerful notation, and I strongly prefer it now. Here's a sketch of shear forces. These um, acting individually would cause compression in the top fiber, and they would cause positive slope on the face in question if the boundary uh, along the axes were fixed as shown. They also would cause uh, positive curvature as shown. Here's a sketch of moments showing their positive sense. In each case, these will tend to cause compression in the top surface. They will tend to cause positive slopes and positive curvatures. Again, assuming that the element were clamped at the far boundaries. Finally, I'll sketch twist moments. These also cause compression in the top fiber. They cause positive slopes and positive curvatures in this situation. The plane sections concept in the Kirchhoff-Love plate theory is remarkably similar to that for beams. It's the bending of the midplane that really uh, sets the problem up, and we're interested in how that departs from the initial flat surface. If there's no stretching, that means that the midplane does not move right or left, but rather moves only vertically. So you can take the center point of any of these plane sections scribed on the body, and the, um, that plane section will only rotate as shown in the figure below and will not translate horizontally. Because of that, you can identify that the horizontal motion U will be a function of the rotation. And that rotation is basically the slope of the middle surface. So as with the beam problem, we can make this statement to the right, that the, the displacement in the horizontal direction is a z-coordinate times the slope at that point. The minus sign accounts for the fact that when we're up above the neutral surface and when you have a positive slope, that the U displacement is negative. In the YZ plane, you'll get a similar result when you apply this plane sections concept. And that comes out as shown here, giving the V displacement field as a function of the Z coordinate, which is how far above the middle surface you are, and then the slope of the middle surface with respect to the Y coordinate. Now, this plane section remaining perpendicular to the neutral axis after deformation implies directly that these shears are zero. These are shearing strains, and they are by definition zero. Also, the plate is so thin that we would believe there wouldn't be stresses building up through the depth of the plate, and that sigma z is zero. Of course, you can load a plate in the z-direction, and that's a standard way with lateral pressure. But it will turn out that that pressure is really negligible compared with the comparable fiber stresses in the horizontal plane that result from that loading. So this is a reasonable assumption. Lastly, in our elasticity equations soon to be shown, um, I will make an assumption that the lateral 
displacement W is to be characterized by the lateral displacement of the middle surface. And at one point, that will be used throughout the body. When, in fact, there would be a little bit of a Poisson ratio effect. So that's a minor approximation. My approach is going to be to develop the equations for a plate by starting with three-dimensional elasticity theory and then using these previous approximations to gradually knock out terms until you come down to a simplified theory. If you can finally eliminate all the variables except the lateral displacement, then that's called a Navier approach. We're going to start with the general stress-strain law. This is the constitutive law in three dimensions. It's often easiest for me to remember in the directions shown that you show how these stresses will cause these strains. And I remember that often by the fact that you get a direct strain um, due to the stress acting over the Young's modulus, and then you get a contraction in the two lateral directions that's a Poisson ratio effect is shown. There's no coupling between the shearing stresses and the direct stresses and strains, and we get a lot of zeros in here for that reason. And there's no coupling between the shearing stresses and the shearing strains, which is shown here. So really there's um, strong reasons for dividing the strains and displacements in the specific way that that's done in the theory of elasticity. We now write down the general strain displacement law in three dimensions. And here again we have a fair amount of uncoupling where the U displacement causes a strain in the x direction, epsilon x, but, but not the other direct strains, and, and so on. So there's quite a bit of uncoupling here among displacements and strains. The shears are coupled a little bit more. We'll call that matrix D. Now, let's look at the three-dimensional elasticity equations and see how they simplify when we bring in the thin plate assumptions. Two assumptions we made were that the shearing strains were zero. So we can put that on this left side of the constitutive law. And a third assumption was that the stress in the z direction was zero. Now, this third assumption here will allow us to solve for the epsilon z value in terms of the uh, two remaining stresses. We won't exploit the zeros in the shearing strain. We're going to assume that the material locks up and that, in fact, there will be shearing stresses in those um, two um, directions, the tau yz and the tau zx. So we won't do anything with that knowledge except to say that the material locks up in shear. Now let's look at the strain displacement law in three-dimensional elasticity and simplify it. Where we previously had the u and the v displacement, we now put the result from plane sections remaining plane. We also have the zero strain values here. This then allows us to pull out these equations, which now become strain curvature relations for epsilon x, epsilon y. And here is a shear twist sort of relation. Because we've assumed that sigma z is zero, we're going to find that our relations in the plate turn into plane stress relations at each layer of the plate, that is, through the thickness. And we can reduce our system to this set of material laws. If we invert this now, we obtain this relation. So we can map either from stresses to strains or vice versa. Let's work further on the stress-strain law, which is the constitutive law. And we'll put in the 
curvature values that we found for the strains. They enter on the right-hand side here in this location. And if you multiply these out, you now have stress curvature relations. And here is a shearing stress twist relation. You can see that we are headed toward the Navier approach, where we are developing things in terms of the deflection of the middle surface uniformly. And it was one of the miracles of mechanics when that was done for plates because it's relatively easy to visualize and solve problems where the deflection of the middle surface of the plate is the main variable. Let's define what are called force resultants. These are running moments, shear forces, or twists that act on a small chunk of the plate's edge, as shown here, perhaps a distance delta y. I show at the right there the red arrow that is basically the resultant shearing force on that surface. How do you get that? Well, in this case, we integrate the component of shear tau zx, which fortunately has this positive sign in the same direction as v. So we take that tau value, and then the small increment of area is delta y dz. Uh, this would suffice, except we really want a running shear, and that is per unit width. So we divide out by the delta y, and that gives us this uh, definition. And you'll likewise get such a definition uh, in the um, face that is away from us, looking into the origin on the far side, where we define V sub Y. Now let's complete our study of the force resultants. We need to find the running moment and running twist on a cut edge. This first equation is for the moment MX, shown at the right. There's a minus sign because of the sign convention on stress sigma x, which when multiplied times the moment arm z leads to a negative moment. So we need to compensate with that minus sign. The same thing would happen on the running moment on the face that we cannot see looking into the origin from the far side. And again, you get a minus sign. You get the stress sigma y involved. For the twisting component shown here, you find that, again, there's a minus relation because the positive sign convention for shear is as shown. And when multiplied by the moment arm z, you find that, again, you get a negative moment from that. So it's interesting that we're getting so many negative signs in our basic definitions, but that's part of the whole process. Now I will write down a summary of those force resultants. And here they are. Each of them involves an integration through the z dimension. And this effectively eliminates the z coordinate from the problem. So we replace distributed stress patterns with these force resultants. We just found the resultant forces. Earlier, we had found a relation between stresses and curvatures. Now, I'd like to join those two ideas. When we do, we can get a relation between those running moments, say, which are functions of stress. Then we can insert the earlier formulas for the stress curvature law. The z-coordinate is added in here clearing out some of these terms that are only functions of x and y and keeping the z integral here, we're starting to get a separation of the roles of the um, x, y, and z coordinates. We can evaluate that integral in z, and it has this cubic thickness relation. If we join that with the constants up front, we get this interesting quantity called bending rigidity, and it's universally given the symbol d and defined here. 
This plays a role similar to the moment of inertia of a conventional Euler-Bernoulli beam. It's something like a running stiffness. And you see it relates a running load or a force-like quantity with the curvature. You can do similar things to find these other functions here where we put the running moment in the y direction as a function of curvatures, primarily the curvature in the y direction, which is interesting, uh, with the Poisson ratio coupling into the curvature in the cross direction. And then the twisting moment here is related to the twist of the middle surface. Well, we have to catch our breath now. I think we've done a lot of work and seen a lot of equations. This might be time to have a quick cup of tea before proceeding. Now we're going to take the equilibrium concept, which we haven't used yet, and see what we can find from it. If we take a small chunk of plate and put it in equilibrium with these forces, then we can ask how the force balance will vary from face to face. I'm carrying these small differential quantities, which indeed are related to first derivatives of the functions involved. We'll expand those differential quantities in the next figure. For the flexure problem, there are three equilibrium statements. You must satisfy force equilibrium in the z direction, and you must satisfy moment equilibrium about the x and y axes. First of all, the sum of forces in the z direction leads to these terms. I've introduced a lateral pressure, P, now. It's positive upwards in the positive sense, and so calling it a pressure might be a little misleading, but I think this term is universally used. If we cancel the dx dy terms, which appear uniformly here, you see, and are um, arbitrary small quantities, then you immediately come up with an equation for this lateral equilibrium. Secondly, we sum moments. Now you can do this about a y-axis running parallel to one of the edges or through the centroid. I'm choosing a centroidal y-axis with a positive sense as shown here to the right. You'll have to do this on your own at the side because it takes about five minutes to convince yourself that these are all useful terms. Included in here, however, is at least one term of higher order in which you get dx times dx times dy, and that will be negligible in the limit if dx and dy become small. So that term, in fact, will drop out. And after suitable cancellation of other terms, you arrive at this as one of the moment balances. The other moment balance is found by taking a sum of moments about a centroidal x-axis. And that yields this equation. So now what we have are three equations of equilibrium in terms of resultant forces. And yet, we know how to write those resultant forces in terms of curvatures of the middle surface. So we're just about there. Our goal now is to put all of our force-like quantities in terms of displacement-like quantities. And we'll start out by using the moment balance equations that we had to solve for the shears in terms of curvatures. One of the moment equations was like this, and when we put in the relations that we had found earlier for moments in terms of curvature and twist in terms of curvature, we'll end up with this expression. We'll drop the subscript zero on the middle surface deflection w because it's the only deflection of interest now. There's really no confusion caused by that. So I have the moment relation there and the twist relation here, and when they're properly summed, you get the shear curvature relation. The second moment balance also provides us with information about shear. 
where we ultimately get our shear in terms of the deflections of the middle surface. Now we're able to put everything together and put the shear expressions into the equation for equilibrium balance in the z direction. So this was a direct force balance here. We put in what we know now about the shears, collect terms, and now we have everything in terms of these higher derivatives. Interestingly, the shears themselves go like third derivatives, and now these forces go like fourth derivatives of the middle surface deflection. When you combine those terms, you have this interesting pattern here. Um, this is often called the biharmonic equation because this set of operators that are in the large parentheses here um, is like the Laplace operator squared. So uh, if the Laplace operator is the harmonic operator, then these derivatives are like the biharmonic operator. And the D brings in the physical properties of the plate, its thickness, its materials. This is the lateral loading over here, positive upwards. If you look into the force balance, you'll find it on the left side. These are each forces downward due primarily to, here you see, to a curvature effects along the x-axis. This is a twisting effect yielding a downward force. And this is primarily due to curvatures in the y direction and then balancing this upward force per unit area. So. Um, this equation is a balance of forces and with the logical sign sense. It's valid for infinitesimal deflection, and we don't have any coupling with the in-plane stretching, which we will only add in later as an afterthought in a linear way. I'd like to collect the results that we've found to this point and summarize them. Here's our basic plate equation in all its glory. But we can use symbols D for the flexural rigidity, and we can use a symbol del fourth for the biharmonic operator. And with that shorthand notation, the flexural equation becomes D del fourth W equals P. And now we have a nice equation for plates that can be handled rather straightforwardly. We don't have the boundary conditions for it yet. Lagrange developed this equation in 1811, but the boundary conditions really weren't understood for many years after that. Boundary conditions, in fact, are so important for plates that when Kirchhoff figured those out using energy methods, they named the whole theory after him. So that's an unusual thing. There were other people, we've mentioned Lagrange, uh, Sophie Saint-Germain, a French woman, a physicist, actually found some of the first um, equations that included the effect of in-plane stretching as coupling in with the out-of-plane bending. I'm going to discuss boundary conditions here in terms of a rectangular plate and show what goes on at the right edge. Here, you can have clamped boundary conditions, you can have simply supported, and you can have free edges. These are what I would call the homogeneous boundary conditions. That is, when you set one or another of several quantities to be zero. There are other more exotic boundary conditions sometimes discussed, especially in the higher order plate theories, perhaps the Menland theories. But for us, this should do. I've prepared a table of boundary conditions. Now these are for the edge on the right side of the rectangular plate that we saw in the previous figure. On the left, I have a column of physical quantities such as deflection and slope. On the right, I have the three classic boundary conditions of clamped, simply supported, and free. There never has been much argument that a clamped edge has both a zero deflection and a zero slope looking perpendicularly from the cut edge into the plate. 
Likewise, it's pretty well agreed that a simply supported edge has no deflection along that edge, nor does it have this moment component. Now, this moment vector would be lying parallel to the edge, but it emphasizes the curvature going into the plate and measured perpendicularly from that cut edge. The real trouble was on the free boundary condition, the reason being that historically people wanted to separately put moment, shear, and twist to be zero. But that was three boundary conditions when really only two are needed. This was what Kirchhoff cleared up with his energy approach. Energy approaches do give you not only the proper differential equation, they also give you the consistent boundary conditions. Well, this was resolved then into the condition that the moment must be zero here, and then that a combination of twist and shear had to be zero. Actually, it turns out that the rate of change of twist creates a shear-like force, and you have to look at the difference of those two quantities set together to be zero. So that appears in the far column there. We've now posed what would be a complete boundary value problem expressed in terms of displacements. But when you actually get into plate theory and you do practical problems, you find that sooner or later you need the internal stresses, and that's often the goal. So we have to be able to recover stresses after we've found the displacement field. This can be done by going back to the stress curvature laws that we developed and then evaluating those stresses at the upper and lower surface of the plate where that kind of flexural stress would be extreme. So I'm putting these values here for you. You can leave them either in terms of the middle surface deflection of the plate or in terms of the moments that are appearing at various cross sections. And you can look at both the MX and the MY components. Notice that the uh, thickness of the plate appears squared in the denominator, so for thin plates carrying moments, you can get quite high stresses. Now, the shearing stress is a little different than the uh, direct stresses found at the extreme fibers. There could be shearing stresses in the plan view of the problem, and that's often considered, but another shearing stress is the one through the thickness of the plate. Now, you remember earlier we had said that there was a locking behavior, that we allowed the shear strain to be zero, but we were going to hold off on talking about shear stress through the thickness. That would be those shearing stress quantities with Z in there, uh, subscripts. Well, here are the values of shear that you would get through the thickness of the plate and due to an assumed parabolic distribution of the shear stress through the thickness. And these would be the best estimate you could do considering that the shearing strain is locked up and then you have the plane sections. To this point, we've been studying plates with equilibrium ideas. An alternate approach is to use potential energy. Potential energy can be used itself in two ways, either as a general variation where you come up with the appropriate differential equations and consistent boundary conditions, or secondly, in a direct variation which would yield practical results through perhaps the Rayleigh-Ritz formulation where you assume modes. Um, the key ingredient probably in the potential energy method is the strain energy of the plate. And there again, we can proceed in two ways. We can either integrate the stress strain over the volume of the body, or we can integrate the moment curvature over the surface area of the plate. We'll start out talking about the stress strain integration, and it's literally this general formula, which would be true for any elastic body. When you put in the stress values that we had found earlier and the strain values here, both are in terms of the displacement W. 
and many people call this a quadratic form. Strain energy, after all, is a measure of energy stored in a plate when it's deflected. So every lateral deflection will contribute some energy in the sense that it's a squared quantity. So you don't get negative energies. Let's now carry out this integration of strain energy density over the volume of the plate. When we multiply those terms out uh, that form that quadratic product, we get all of these terms shown above. There are some dominant terms that involve the second derivative squared, the product of those two, and these two terms. And by bringing those down below in this location and this location, we see that there's the possibility of forming a perfect square. Unfortunately, the um, interior term here has a new on it. It's not quite in the right form. So we're going to add and subtract the same term to in, in this location and in the location below and form a perfect square in a second. The other thing we should notice is that the z integral um, is rather placid because there's a z squared term in each of the um, interior terms in the integrand, those can be factored out, and then the midplane displacement w doesn't depend on the z coordinate. And so we end up with this integral shown here, uh, which is a simple integral, and then when it's uh, combined with this constant that appears out front of the, all these elastic terms, we now are able to call that the flexural rigidity d. In the next figure, we'll work on this perfect square idea. In the next figure, then, I've added and subtracted that term that causes a perfect square. Here it is. It's this term with a plus 2 on it. We've added it above, but then we have to subtract it below. And in so doing, then, we've created the perfect square here. This becomes a quantity del squared w quantity squared. <coughs>